make it uh, completely aware of what's happening, okay? I want it to be 100% on the ball that you all know. So I want to pull up the uh, things that we would like to have, okay? So number one is in the lesson content folder, unit one, in this unit one overview, okay? There is, uh, the, it tells you exactly what we have here. The unit one is on Tuesday. It must be started from 10.30 to 10.35. Class starts at 10.30. Therefore, here's the drill. Uh, with COVID, of course, I put remote testing because I was doing collaborate and everything was refreshed. Uh, and uh, it creates unique opportunities, shall we say, when we test remotely. And so to help limit the opportunities for cheating, uh, y'all take the exam at the exact same time. All right, that helps to limit the temptation, shall we say. That is, it doesn't, you don't want to be spending your time helping somebody else with their test if you're working on your own, okay? So, all right, and it's 75 minutes, which is exactly the length of the class. So by, what would that be, 11.45, you're done, okay? So it's not terribly hard. Um, the questions on there, I don't even remember, gosh, it was, I think it's 50 multiple choice questions. They're very similar to the, the quizzes you've been taking, so similar. But I can guarantee you 100% that I have gone, every one of the multiple choices that are on this thing, will be in the PowerPoints. It will be. The answers are in there. I guarantee you, I make the questions, I go back to the PowerPoint, and I 100% guarantee there's a match. Okay? I would not put it on there if there was not a 100% match. Okay? So now, at 10.30, you ought to be going to... Uh, in fact, even, even before that, is that, remember, this is not open book. And you wouldn't do that, right? Because open book is, no, it's not open book. It's, it's just not. But remember, you're allowed to have a study guide, okay, that you create. And remember that you're going to submit these things after the exam. Does that sound familiar? We talked about it on the first day, but uh, that was a long time ago. So here is a rubric to help explain what, you know, how I would grade it, but perhaps better. Here is a, a fairly good example of what somebody created for a study guide, okay? This is somebody else's, uh, what they created. You can see they kind of summarized the major points, right? So it's a two-page document. Look at that. They were even the action potential and the neuron. Ooh, that's awesome. Okay, so you should be creating a two-page document for the exam that you can use, and then it gets submitted as points as well. So basically, this ought to be free. As long as you do your work and submit it, it's free points, right? It's, and it's designed to uh, force you to think perhaps about what the most important points in the material are, because you can't obviously put everything on, on two pages. So um, it's... The submission link for these would be where? It's got to be someplace logical, right? Yeah, right there. There's a submission link. So after the exam is over, you're going to need to find some way, because obviously this person, and you know what, I'll go out on a limb and say this female person, I don't remember for sure, but I think I'm probably right, okay? Most likely correct. Uh, that after physically creating a handwritten paper, need to find some way to turn that into a PDF file. All right, you know, you all know how to do that. Hey, there's your answer. The easiest way is if you have a scanner, right? Zing, zing. Those are awesome. But if you don't, there are a ton. I've heard that if you have a, an Apple product, the Notes app is can be used. I, I don't know that one, but there are a ton of Apps that you can download. Uh, I know the, the one that 
was the standard for years was uh, CAM scanner. Right, that was the one that used for a long time. I don't know what you're going to use, but it's uh, it's not that hard to do, and it is a a skill set that you should have that's independent from psychology, but a skill set that you should have is the ability to create a PDF file. Right, they are universal. A PDF files are great because what happens is, um, generally speaking, you can't modify them, and so they become kind of standardized. And, you know. Whatever. Okay. So uh, that's our new. So you have a study guide, and it's you've hopefully you made it before the exam because the act of creating the study guide is the act of studying, right? So if you want to make it after the exam, I will not know the difference, but it seems kind of stupid to me, right? That you're going to do the work anyway, okay? So then the actual exams would be where? Probably in an exam folder, right? Exams and quizzes, look at that. All right, and so there it is. You can see it will pop up after available to students on Tuesday, 10.30. Okay, so there's what it is. And I want to point out, since I'm in here, um, as I said, I had a lot of uh, zeros in the gradebook. A lot of zeros in the gradebook. So... I don't want to start a class with a lot of zeros in the gradebook, right? That doesn't help anybody. So one time only, I'll be the nice guy. I opened everything up. Okay? I sent that in an email the other day. So you, you did a either did not do a discussion post or did a shitty job on one. Now's the time to take care of it. Okay? So take care of it. Get these quizzes. Um, I did have a couple of people say that because we had gone remote, they just didn't even understand what was happening or what they were supposed to do. So, all right, all right. So they're all open. So remember, these things, these these quizzes, you can take as many times as you want. It's just the final, whatever the last score you achieve. And each time you go through, it's going to pick different questions, right? It's picking it out of a, a big test bank, okay? In fact, the test bank here that are used for these quizzes came directly from the textbook publisher, that or the, the textbook, not publisher, because it's a free textbook, right? The, the online book. Mm -hmm. So I had a problem with the quiz last night. Mm -hmm. I took it a couple of times, mm -hmm. and then my, on my third attempt, I got one or two questions in, mm -hmm. and then my browser crashed. Oh, that's your browser, yeah. Yeah, so, and it won't let you try again after it. Mm. Oh, it, it, even on this one? Yeah, so, so like it says you've got to do it all in one session. So you can try like back to back to back to back. Uh -huh. As soon as you close that tab, you can't do it again. I don't know about that. I'd have to yeah, look at that. Like, uh, yeah, the multiple attempts have to be like at the same time. Okay. So if it's taking the last attempt and I only answer two questions, it's kind of a problem. I had some good attempts. I was trying to get a 100. I understand. Maybe it would be... Uh, I'm guessing it would reset because I think it was a maximum of 30 minutes to take it. So maybe would it reset after 30 minutes? It might. I'll, I'll look again. Okay. Because I, I must tell you that uh, some of this stuff is less than wonderful. And, and what you're saying is true and it happens on exams and, oh, I got 10 items in and now I can't. And I cannot like open it up and just let you in there. There's no function for me to do that. And it makes no sense that I can't. But the, all I can do is reset them. I reset them. In some cases, if, if a student has gotten to like item 45 or something like that, then I, pro, I, I often will uh, calculate how what percentage you get correct and let's assume that's the percent you would have gotten. Yeah, so, so. so I had a couple of other attempts before that because uh -huh. it'll let you see the previous attempts because uh -huh. then you can just grab on those. Okay. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't. Honestly, I'll tell you the truth. I've never taken an online exam in my life. Why, why would I, right? I mean, so this stuff came up way past my time. My second question is these unit exams, mm -hmm. do they need to like be in the, the like Respondus Lockdown browser? No, I'm not start? doing that. I, okay. I would love to do things like that, but I just the number of nightmares that I anticipate from that yeah. has said I'm not going to do that. It's a less than optimized piece of software. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's um I wish I had the ability to do that, but there's just too many, too many problems. All right, so y'all basically clear on what it is that's uh, expected here. 
So you got the ability to catch up up until Monday, right? You can catch up on all of this other stuff, right? Tuesday is this exam, and so come come Tuesday, any anything that I, I in fact took all the zeros out of the grade book this morning and left them blank. Okay, you go into that grade book, and if you had a blank, take care of it. All right, take care of the blank space. And because uh, I will definitely be putting them back to zeros if they're blank on Tuesday. All right, so up no Monday. What's up, uh, you? Jackie. Jackie. Uh, for the exam, do we take it in class like do we come here and then take it? No, you do this any old place you so desire. Um, it doesn't matter where. There's computer lab on campus, right? Um, if uh, we actually have a computer lab that we can access, a relatively small one with about eight computers back over in here. So if you don't really have a good place or you're on, I'll be here. You know, I'll be in my office here. My office is right over there, right, right across the hall. So if you're around, we'll find you a place to do it, whatever it takes. Huh? All right. Any other questions before we move on to consciousness? Back to consciousness. Okay, cool. Back to consciousness. Okay. All right. Boom. So, we started on this uh, material on states of consciousness. And uh, remember what we pointed out is, is we've got a situation that's incredibly problematic because consciousness does not exist. If there is, like, four cups of consciousness, it, it has no existence and yet somehow we're going to try to study it. Um, okay. <laughs> so we played around trying to define consciousness and finding it was somewhat of a tricky thing to define. There we go. Kind of tricky to define. But we talked about various ways that we could talk about it. Oh, yes, and we talked about sleep, which is a, a altered state of consciousness, for lack of a better word. Uh, why do we sleep? And we finally talked about sleep debt, which is a kind of a cool idea. And so now we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about sleep. Okay? So we find sleep researchers are going to measure things like eye movements, uh, muscle tension, brain waves. It'd be kind of hard to get a restful night's sleep here. This dude's pretending to sleep. He's not really asleep. You can tell, right? You can tell he's faking it. So we find that falling asleep, it, it uh, like we said, here, I, I got it. It's crooked there. But you see what happens there at the top? Those are brainwave patterns while you're awake. These are brainwave patterns while you're asleep. And so you see that? It just, it's an abrupt change. It doesn't, like... You know, change grad. Nope, it's just in an instant. Okay. If you yawn, you give a brief boost of, it meta of metabolism in your brain to speed it up. Uh, but as you're falling asleep, breathing slows down. Um, oh, how about these hypnagogic sensations or hallucinations? You know, you're just on the edge of sleep and you feel like you're falling. And the light kicks. Does that happen to anybody else or is that a joke? Happens to other people. Okay, see, I'm not a weirdo, all right? So, yeah, it's just at the edge of sleep. And you're, it's a hallucination, not a dream. Okay? And as, as weird as it is, everybody does it. And, and as soon as I kick my leg, man, I'm wide awake. Bam, I'm off, all right? So, not cool, not cool. Um, okay, and so your brain waves change. Um, so here is uh, brainwave patterns while we're sleeping. We're going to call it NREM. So that only makes sense in the fact that uh, when we get down, it's gonna, we're going to get REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement. And so this is not rapid eye movement, stage one. Not rapid eye movement, stage two. Not rapid eye movement, stage three. So we can see that there are distinct differences here between these three different stages of sleep. NREM 3 is, this is the deep sleep. You know, when somebody wakes you up in NREM 3 sleep, this is where you're like, where am I? Uh, where's, where's the bed? What's going on? I mean, this is utter confusion up in this area, okay? This is relatively light sleep. It wouldn't take much to wake you up kind of thing. 
But as we said, the most interesting part of sleep is REM sleep. And in fact, it's almost like, why do we have stage one, two, and three sleep? So that we can have REM. It's like that, it almost feels like the whole point of sleep is not this, it's this. This is where all of the cool stuff seems to happen. Okay? And I'm positive you can't just dismiss this, but it's really here. Okay? And so what happened is um, while you're sleeping, there are, there are periods where your eyeballs are going to be flopping all over the place like a crazy dude. And we call it rapid eye movement, and it's associated with dreaming. So when you dream, your eyeballs are flopping all over. It's really an odd, odd thing. Okay? You find the heart rate rises, breathing becomes rapid. We have paralysis, okay? That is, while sleep, while dreaming, the muscles will no longer move at all. And the, the belief is that that, that uh, prevents you from acting out whatever it is you're dreaming about, okay? That's the idea, except your fingertips will move, but that's it. Huh? So we find that here is the basic pattern of sleep throughout the night. You're awake, you go in NREM 1, 2, 3, back up, and then you have a little short period of dreaming. Then you go back down, back up, maybe a little bit of awakeness, but a little more dreaming. Back down, maybe a little bit more, I guess you had to get up and pee, right? Then longer and longer dreaming as the night goes on. With older people, it's less. <coughs> Look at that! Awake, 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 all night long. So, all right. So dreams are uh, fairly consistent, and I I'm sure that uh, the this is some of the uh, stuff. Blind people, by the way, have dreams as well, but their dreams are not visual. Okay, their dreams involve the sense organs that they do have. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. But uh, this is the one that always frustrates me. Repeatedly trying to do something and failing. And it's always got to do with like, you're supposed to be uh, at the airport in two hours and you've got to pack your luggage and you just can't get it. You just can't figure out what you're supposed to do to get the luggage packed, all right? Or the one where you show up at the final exam and you realize you never actually took the class. <laughs> Anybody have that one yet? You haven't been in college long, so. <laughs> and then there's my side. I show up to teach a class and realize I don't know what the hell the class is. <laughs> That's a good dream. All right, so fairly consistent uh, in, in, in the types of dreams that people have or the, the themes or something like that. Dreaming is experienced by all mammals in the world except the echidna. It's a, one of them weird Australian marsupials, you know, them weird ones up in there. I, it makes no sense why you will find a single mammal that does not dream. But because you find it uh, in all mammals, it makes you think that it, from an evolutionary perspective, it, it must have some function. Dreaming must have some function that is true of all animals. Right? This is not just a human thing. So when you look for this answer, because we're going to ask questions like, oh, why do we dream? Okay? And when we ask that question, we ought to start thinking in a more global perspective because you, know, you ain't going to have an opossum with dreams if there wasn't a reason for it. All right? There has to be a reason. Um, when, you're un oh, yeah, when you learn new material, you dream more. Okay, so the more the more new stuff you're getting, the more dreaming you tend to have. Okay, which uh, to me hints at the idea that, as we had said last time, the hippocampus is that part of the brain where memories seem to be placed temporarily, and then gradually they move to the cerebral cortex. And if if I had to make a guess about what is the point of dreaming. I say that's what it is. All right, that's my my guess. Okay, uh, you get more REM sleep if you're under a lot of stress. Okay, uh, people with depression can get some relief if you take away REM sleep. Weird. This is odd. 
if you take people, and you know what, you put them in a sleep lab, and every time they start to dream, you wake them up, okay? They dream, wake them up, dream, wake them up. They had 10 hours of sleep, right, but no REM sleep. And they get up and they're utterly exhausted. They're just like, it's like they had never gone to bed. All right, what was the point of that 10 hours? I got nothing. And so what happens is if you deprive somebody of REM sleep and then let them go to sleep, they immediately go into REM sleep. But remember the pattern was, you gotta wait quite some time before the first dream happens, right? But if I deprive you of REM, it's like your body is screaming, I need this thing. I must have this thing and I'm going to get it immediately. But it's, what's odd is people with schizophrenia do not show this, okay? Everybody else does, but people with schizophrenia do not show this. And we'll talk schizophrenia later. So here's some potential explanations, okay? And here's a good opportunity for me to reiterate, Freud is full of shit, okay? Freud is full of shit. Um, I, I, in fact, when I was in Vienna a couple years ago, I was in Vienna, Austria, and uh, there was the Sigmund Freud Museum. I was like, oh my God, except it was on the other side of the city. And my wife had no interest in going to the Sigmund Freud Museum. So I went to the Sigmund Freud Museum on my own, almost got lost, and the only, I was not going to pay money to go into that shit place. Instead, I took a selfie of me at the museum, poo, just like a, that's it. That's all I got is a selfie of me flipping off the museum. Just, uh, okay, so what happens, and we're gonna talk some Freud later, but what happens is Freud says, if you have thoughts and memories that are too difficult or painful for you to deal with, you're going to repress them down below the level of, of awareness, okay? You won't know they're there, they'll go down, okay? But just because you're not aware of them and you kind of shove them down, doesn't mean they're gone, they're still there, okay? So in a classic interpretation of Freud, it'd be like, oh, I had a dream of the Washington Monument, you know, which is just long, straight, tall, right? And so Freud would, would say like, oh, okay, you have repressed homosexual desires and that Washington Monument represents a giant penis. And it's like, are you shitting me, dude? Freud is full of shit, all right? I can't repeat that enough in my opinion. So he believes that a dream is a uh, safe way to reveal those repressed things. Okay? Information processing, and that's the one that I, that I was jumping on board with, that uh, as it says, you know, you've got all this stuff in your hippocampus, eventually it's gotta move into your, to your cerebral cortex, when does it happen? And often our dreams are very, very uh, reflective of what we've been doing during that day. And so I personally really get on board with the information processing. Physiological is this idea that um, the, 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 that the brain during REM sleep is, is very active. And we already know based on those little rat studies, remember the enriched rats and the impoverished rats? Just having activity is good for your brain. And so you're giving your brain the extra activity that it needs. Maybe. Activation synthesis, uh, random memories, I don't know. I'm not a big fan. But one of, one of the theories actually was, it's just nuts. It goes like this. You know that if you take a cup of water, that it's gonna become stagnant pretty soon. If you just leave it sitting for a while, instead moving water, with moving water, it oxygenates it. You know, if you've ever had an aquarium with fish, you gotta add water to the, or uh, air, uh, an air pump, otherwise the water's gonna get stale and the, the fish are gonna die, okay? And the logic is that you have liquid inside your eyeballs, and during REM sleep, you're shaking it all up and that stirs up the oxygen so that the cells don't die inside your eyeballs and you don't go blind. <laughs> That's kind of odd, but okay, okay. Help prevent you from going blind. I like it, I like it. Okay. So what we find here is uh, 
Look at this. A, a, a newborn baby, 16 hours a day of sleep. And of those 16 hours, 8 hours is dreaming. Okay? So the baby is just in this huge dream state. And if the information processing approach is true, it makes sense because with a baby, every single thing is new material, isn't it? Everything. So when you're learning new material, you dream more. As you get older, you're less. So look at that. By the time you're a little bit older here, it's like six and a half hours, seven hours is the average amount of sleep for the night. But it doesn't always work quite right. Has anybody ever seen a CPAP device like this? You know, it's, uh, what happens with some, uh, like, yeah, here it is, sleep apnea. Some people, what happens is, while sleeping, that the back of the throat closes. And what will happen is that uh, that'll, that'll cut off oxygen. And so the brain, after not receiving oxygen for about 20, 30 seconds, will wake you up. Okay? And so then what happens, though, and this is, this is crazy, is that memories of things that occurred within two minutes of falling asleep don't occur. You don't, you don't remember the last two minutes before you fall asleep. It just doesn't happen. Okay? And so what happens with somebody with apnea is... They, they wake up, start to breathe, and fall asleep again right away. And what happens is somebody with apnea can be awake, can be waking up 50, 60, 70 times a night and remembering nothing. Okay, what's up? Why is it that you don't know when you don't sleep? Why? sleep apnea, uh, the constant flow of air by these machines will, will prevent the back of the throat from closing. Mm -hmm. sure. We have narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is, is uh, where people will basically fall asleep and go straight into REM sleep at strange times. Okay? Narcolepsy is not simply falling asleep, right? It's, it's, it's going... It, Narcolepsy is problematic, especially here in the you know in this day and age, because um, if you live in Texas, you kind of pretty much must be able to drive. You pretty much must have a car. And as you can probably imagine, if the Department of Motor Vehicles finds out you have narcolepsy, that's the end of your driver's license. All right, and that's sensible. Correct. I mean, that uh, you don't want somebody to be driving a two-ton. A missile and then falling asleep at irregular intervals. Yeah, that is an issue. You've got somnambulism, which is a funky word for sleepwalking. Uh, sleepwalking and sleep talking, falls in families. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, a nightmare is just a bad dream. All right. So it's during REM sleep is when we have a nightmare. But a night terror happens here when we're in deep deep sleep. And uh, a night terror, if somebody that has a night terror, they'll, they'll like scream or they'll be sweating. They're just like very psychological. It's distressed, much distressed. And you wake that person up, you sit, and they say, I don't know what it was. It was just a primitive emotional fear, something like this. Okay, So it, it, there was no content to it per se. And so a night terror is down here, a nightmare is up there. Right. So briefly now, we've got this notion of states of consciousness. And we find that, of course, being awake and being asleep are two distinctly different sets of con types of consciousness. But we find that the use of drugs can lead to other distinctly different states of consciousness. Right? They have distinct brainwave patterns, etc. So I want to briefly talk about the different uh, types of uh, drugs that are out there. Uh, the depressants, the stimulants, and the hallucinogens are going to be the three that we 
focus on. But you find certain things, such as marijuana, for example, that kind of does some of all of it, right? So we see these circles overlapping each other. And so some drugs are more uh, specifically only doing one thing or these others. So a stimulant will activate you, will get you moving. A depressant will slow you down. And a hallucinogen, hallucinogen will give you altered perceptions. Okay? So you find marijuana right at the center as one of all three. Okay? So we find psychoactive drugs, yada, yada, yada. What we find is psychoactive drugs have their effect. When you take any of these drugs, if the effect of these drugs will be in the synapse. Remember that space between neurons? Remember we said that there was neurotransmitters in there. And it turns out that all of these different things have some kind of an effect in the synapse. Either fooling your brain into thinking you have more of a neurotransmitter than you actually do, maybe fooling your brain into thinking you have less of the neurotransmitter, maybe, remember that process of reuptake? where the neurotransmitter gets pulled back. Maybe these drugs are going to mess with that process. So it's going to do something in that, in that synapse. You know, depending on what the drug is and what the effect is, something is happening in that area. Okay. So, yeah, I want to mention this. Here's, for example, uh, tolerance. And so what happens is that with somebody that is using a drug for the first time, that uh, what happens is the, the effect of the drug uh, starts to happen. You know, here's the dose of the drug, and here's basically how, how much high you get, or something, how high you get. And you can see here, for er, uh, first time drug users, they, they start to feel the effect of the drug very, very small dose, right? They start to feel it. Somebody that is now. Um, exhibiting tolerance because they are a regular user, I mean, it takes this much before they even start to feel something. And so you can see that in order to achieve the same level of uh, effect, you have to have more and more and more of the drug going on. Okay, So it's a pretty cool procedure. We find what happens, in fact, maybe I'll just draw a picture. What's happening here is that when you take a drug, this is the, you know, this is what happens, right? But what happens is many drugs, as I say, they imitate neurotransmitters. So, for example, cocaine uh, imitates dopamine. So if you were to take cocaine, your brain is basically reading this and saying, damn, I got a lot of dopamine, okay? And you're going to be just all crazy shit going on, okay? So what's happening, though, is at some point here, all right, your body's going to be like, I don't need that much dopamine. Why do I have so much dopamine in my body? And what it's going to do is it's going to start to shut down dopamine. Okay? It's going to turn it off, right? That makes sense. And so the body's going to turn down dopamine. You see this? So this is what the drug does. This is what the body does underneath. It's shutting down dopamine. And so what happens for you as an, a, a, a user, this is how high you get, okay? But then all of a sudden, look at this. This, this is what the drug should be doing. This is what you feel, right? Because that one's sucking away from it. And so now what happens is the body comes back up like this, eventually it sets it. But here's what happens with the, well, eventually the drug wears out. And your experience then is this. Okay? So what happens here is the effect of the drug is gone, it's out of your system, but the body is still doing its under process, and you know what that is? It's called a hangover or whatever you would call it with your specific drug. Right? Whatever your drug is, that's what it is. So it's really an interesting thing how the body interacts with these. Because what happens is somebody that has uh, experienced a lot of drug, what will happen is that it'll look similar to this, but a person that, that is, uh, ha is very experienced with a drug, again, here's what the drug does. 
but the body's underlying process starts right here, rather than it's almost immediate and it's much, 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 much like this. And so a person that has taken a lot of drugs, clearly that is the experience they have. Okay? And so you find that somebody that's, that somebody that's addicted to drugs ends up in this stage right here, which is an extended hangover for all practical purposes. They call it withdrawal. And so what happens is people um, that are strung out will continue to take the drug, not in order to get high, but just to get back to normal, right? Just to get back to their original level. So pretty interesting, interesting stuff. So some examples of depressants, right? Depressants reduce neural activity. Um, alcohol, all right? Alcohol is a, one of the biggest depressants out there. Obviously, the one which gets abused a lot at the university. So we find that approximately 12 ounces of beer is approximately equal to five ounces of wine, approximately equal to one and a quarter ounces of uh, hard liquor. Okay, that's, you know. We find that uh, the body processes alcohol about one drink per hour. Um, we find some interesting things that uh, about about alcohol, and that it gets stored in. Uh, well, anyway, did uh, yeah, which is da, 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 da. yeah, whatever. So it depresses things. But what, you know, it's a depressant, and so one of the things that it depresses or slows down is the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are that part of your brain that's responsible for uh, making good choices, shall we say, <laughs> okay? So, you know, some people think, oh, alcohol must be a stimulant because I go out and woohoo! Yeah, that's right, because it depressed the frontal lobe's ability to tell you that's a really bad choice you're making right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbiturates are a type of drug, uh, tranquilizers basically, used for reducing anxiety and inducing sleep, but uh, as you can guess, there's going to be some uh, issues with them that influence memories, judgments, concentration, and what happens is uh, very important is that drugs can have some strange effects if you mix them, all right? And so in particular, what happens is if the alcohol gets you this drunk and the barbiturates get you this high, if you have an alcohol bar plus barbiturates, you should get this high, right? Nope, you get this high, all right? They have what's called a synergistic effect. They don't just add to each other, they explode on each other. So certain combinations are just not a good idea. And this is definitely one of them. Another category of depressants are the opiates. The opiates um, are originally, originally deprived from opium, right? The opium poppies. Opium is uh, mainly, you know, one of the one of the crazy things is, you know, in Afghanistan, the Taliban are were some pretty nasty sons of bitches, but the one thing that the Taliban did very well was they made sure that their farmers were not making opium, all right? The poppies for the opium, they got that shit under control, all right? As soon as the Taliban fell, whoop, up goes the opium, all right? Bam. So, interesting, interesting. So, we find that part of the problem, opiates are an endorphin agonist. Okay, there's a nice phrase. Endorphins are natural uh, neuro, are neurotransmitters in your body. They're an actual neurotransmitter. They have the effect of reducing pain. And what happens is that opiates, they imitate this endorphin. And it makes your brain act as though you have many, many, many of these. In fact, endorphin literally translates to endogenous morphine, right? Endogenous as an inside, something like that. Morphine is one of the opiates derived from. We find that some of the other things that are derived from the opio, uh, opium is heroin, okay? Um, but what is particularly problematic 
is that there are now synthetic opioids. So you don't even have to go to Afghanistan and get the opium puppy. And it's, um, it, now I'm not familiar, but I, I, I've heard some of these opium deaths, and I mean, it's not in my neighborhood, right? But the fentanyl is, I believe, the one that is the worst, because in certain parts of the world, hint, hint, I'm talking about China, uh, fentanyl costs approximately zero dollars to produce, okay, or awful close to zero dollars. And so I've seen um, some interesting marketing gimmicks where they will send shipments of fentanyl, which are 100% illegal, and their business model goes like this. I can send 1,000 shipments of, of fentanyl. If 999 get intercepted, but one makes it through, I still make a crazy ass profit. All right, can you imagine a business model that works like that? I'm willing to lose 99.9% .9 of my product because it's so cheap to produce and so highly inflated. Interesting, interesting. So uh, I'm sure you've heard that 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 of the opioid epidemic in America and the role that the um, the major pharmaceutical companies have in this epidemic. But unfortunately, though though the major pharmaceutical companies have definitely got to step up, it was this introduction here of incredibly cheap. You don't got to have a prescription for it, opioids that has really really crippled many rural parts of America. Oh, that's a big one. Caffeine is a stimulant. Okay, stimulants, the second category of drugs. They intensify neural activity, increase bodily functioning. Okay? You can have dilated pupil, pupils, increased breathing and heart rate, blood sugar goes up, appetite up, etc. So, uh, the original use of many stimulants was as a diet pill, okay? Because it, it stimulates, uh, it decreases appetite, it increases all of these different things. You're going to burn calories, and it decreases your desire to eat food, okay? So you can see that uh, stimulants were absolutely in the diet marketplace for a long time. Some of the obvious ones are caffeine and nicotine, but amphetamine and its byproduct methamphetamine, coke and ecstasy all fall into this category. So caffeine obviously uh, adds energy, we all know about it. It can lead to withdrawal if you use it too much, leads to headaches, irritability, fatigue. And, and you could, what I just erased over here could have been used very well to describe what happens with, with caffeine uh, with experienced users versus not. You find a cup of coffee has a has a, a lot of caffeine in it, but so does tea. Uh, look at that, a no-dose tablet. Chocolate tends to have quite a bit of caffeine in it. Colas tend to have a lot, uh, but yeah, actual cup of coffee is up there. I guess it depends on how strong you make it. Nicotine is also a stimulant. Okay, um, nicotine is. Is, again, it's going to, like we say, it's going to arouse the brain, it's going to increase the heart rate, it's going to relax the muscles, it's going to release different neurotransmitters to reduce stress, it's going to suppress appetite. Yeah, so many people that quit smoking gain 20 pounds, right? That's just the two go together. Uh, but also it reduces uh, blood flow in the extremities, which can't be good. But the biggest thing... The biggest problem with nicotine uh, is not the nicotine. It's in, in, in the world of drugs, they have this word called vehicle. A vehicle means uh, the method by which the drug has entered your body. Okay? And so nicotine by itself is, yeah, I mean, I don't recommend it, but I don't see it as being much more than caffeine. But what happens is that the nicotine is stuck in a cigarette, which is filled with carcinogens. It's the tobacco leaves and all of that that is giving the carcinogens in there, which is causing the cancers, right? It's not the nicotine. It's the vehicle that is used. So the vehicle that is used can greatly affect the, uh, impact the effect of a drug. And so I, I some, it, some people will take uh, pills 
and crush them up and snort them. Because what happens is at the back of the nose, it uh, is very thin in that area, the epithelium, and the drugs will then go directly into the bloodstream. Rather than go down to your stomach, get digested, da 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 da, it's bam, and it's there. Uh, another one that I've heard of, and I am not recommending it, is some people consume alcohol in other parts of their body. Um, think back end, they have a name for it, it was called butt chugging. Okay, <laughs> I'm not making it up, but it's the same logic is that the alcohol will immediately be brought into. And that is a particularly uh, dangerous activity because if you consume alcohol in your mouth, it gets processed by your liver. If you consume it in the opposite end, it does not get processed by your liver. All right, so it can lead to instant death. So not a recommendation. Why do people smoke? Because they're stupid. You wanted an answer? I gave you one. I can tell you exactly what it was. When I went to high school, right, my high school started in 10th grade, right, Ninth was at the whatever, and I was 14 years old going into high school, in with 10th grade as the first grade, and you got guys in there that are like 19, sometimes even 20, and I'm, not only am I 14, but I'm also the smallest kid for my age, okay, I had not yet had a birth, growth spurt, so I'm like this big, walking into the high school, <laughs> you know what I mean? And instantly, you gotta find somebody, you gotta find somebody. And you know who I found is a smoker, right? They accepted me, even though I was this itty bitty little 14 year old, and so it was all about social acceptance, all right? Just because that's who was smoking, I smoked. So, I uh, smoked for a lot of years, I smoked. I quit just before September 11th, actually, uh, before 9-11. I quit just before that. Thankfully, I got through that. I only cheated one cigarette after I said, I'm going to stop, and then I got lucky. That's for damn sure. Okay, cocaine, as we said, um, it's a stimulant. And you see what happens with cocaine. This is uh, dopamine, and dopamine gets you all woo 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 woo. And so, what does cocaine do? Is it gets in here and blocks up this channel. Because remember, this one releases a neurotransmitter, this one receives a neurotransmitter and fires, then this one should reuptake that neurotransmitter and get rid of it. But because the cocaine gets in here, the neurotransmitter just stays here constantly. Okay? And so it makes your brain go like, dude, I have a lot of dopamine in here right now. And it does, okay? We find um, Cocaine does a variety of things, in particular with dopamine, but uh, also serotonin and norepinephrine receptors. Okay? Methamphetamine. This is another one I'm not familiar with. Uh, hey, I watch Breaking Bad, all right? I'm, I'm all hip on this shit, right? I, but look at this. Here's four years. Here's a girl on the left that had never experienced methamphetamine. Here she is on the right, having discovered the joys of methamphetamine. So, yeah, I don't know much about meth. I just know that uh, it leads to a lot of uh, crime as people are trying to find money to feed their habits. I know that one. Uh, ecstasy. This is a, a, you know, as I'm sure you guys know a hell of a lot more about ecstasy than I do. But I can tell you that uh, the long-term effects of ecstasy are not well known. Okay, this stuff is still pretty new in the in the world of of drugs, and um, some of the research on ecstasy is coming out and saying, you know, I, I've heard that I've heard that if you have ecstasy, then you often have a midweek crash of moods and emotions that hit somewhere on Wednesday. I don't know if that's what I'm hearing. But what I heard was long term that uh, ecstasy is killing the serotonin receptors. And serotonin receptors are the ones that are, are going, uh, going to allow us to have good moods, to be, you know, happy. And so it's literally killing your ability to be, it's not, it's not influencing serotonin itself, 
it's the receptors, okay? If you're messing with the serotonin, yeah, your body makes serotonin all the time. This is different. This isn't messing with serotonin. It's messing with the actual receptors involved, okay? So do your homework. If you choose to do this thing, I ain't your mama, okay? But uh, do your homework because I'm warning you. This, this one I think has got some effects that, that people don't know yet. LSD. LSD is a 100% um, lab made. I mean, many of these are laboratory designed drugs. LSD, we moved into the category of hallucinogens here. And so hallucinogens are the ones that are uh, mind altering of sorts. And so the hallucinogens can include LSD and marijuana. There I go, I got two of them. Um, and it's, it, there's a lot of, don't make you stupid. Anybody hear that one? Don't make you stupid. There is literally research on, on marijuana consumption that does show long-term effects of um, inability to create memories and things of this. We're not just talking, it makes you high and the high goes away. It's, it's a, and again, it's hey, your body, you do your own shit, right? But do your homework, all right? Do your work. There is definitely some research out there on long-term effects, okay? LSD was uh, an, a very problematic drug in America in the 60s because LSD, was, uh, in fact, I can, I guess, my, my stepdad, right, I guess the guy that married my mom, uh, he, he was a Vietnam vet, and uh, he had he, he, very, very, very bad hallucinations and flashbacks on a very regular basis. And it was the direct result of uh, how much LSD he consumed in Vietnam. Because in, during the Vietnam War, there was periods of absolute intense terror in battle, followed by 30, 40 days of just waiting. <laughs> just nothing. Nothing has happened for 30 days. And it turned out that LSD is really cheap, and it was so simple to ship to Vietnam, apparently the, the normal trick that was used was you simply put it underneath a postage stamp as you mail a letter. Okay? So you just put it underneath the postage stamp, put the stamp on top of it, you mail it, and there's enough to get you know 25 people high. <laughs> Okay, I'm just saying that's how that works. Okay, so we talked about sleeping and waking and drugs and all these different levels of uh, types of consciousness. But there's others out there as well, the biggest one being hypnotism, and we'll talk some about, about that, but there's, there's other forms of consciousness, okay? Other ones out there. I remember one time, this study, this was so cool. They were, some researchers were trying to discover, because as we said, um, consciousness doesn't exist, okay? So you can't get a cup of consciousness, but you can measure brain activity, right? And use that as sort of a, a marker or something of consciousness. So there were some researchers that were trying to study religion, and they wanted to see if they could find God, right? I wonder if find God, I can prove. <laughs> this is a true story. So they went to some Catholic nuns, and these Catholic nuns, they, they said, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to you know, think about that time when you were closest to God, when that time in your life when you were, you were spiritually moved, I want you to pray on that. And these nuns, they got into this, this altered state of consciousness for, you know, just, and they, they took a brain scan of these nuns, and when they, when they, went, when they got into this deep prayer, it truly changed. I mean, you found a unique brain state that was there. And so, you know, these nuns were like, that is excellent. Look, I have, I mean, I, I of course knew God was real, but look, I have it. I have a representation of God right there in that scene. Okay, okay. So then they followed it up, and they found some Buddhist monks. And these Buddhist monks, I mean, these are like the, the ones that have, what, master level 56 Buddhist monk. And they put them into meditation, right? Oh, well, I don't do meditation, but right, and they brain scan them. And when these Buddhist monks get down, man, totally into their state, again, the, the brain state just fundamentally changes when they get down there. But you know what's actually pretty cool is the brain scan of the nun and the brain scan of the monk are identical. Oh, okay, well, I guess we found God. I don't know what we found, but 
we definitely found an altered state of consciousness, right? A different way of being. So some of the different uh, states of consciousness, of course, waking and sleeping, but remember, sleeping is not the same as dreaming. Daydreaming is different. Some of them, like hallucinations, are distinctly different. Uh, during the state of orgasm, the actual brain scan, I don't know who volunteered for that study. Uh, if you have food or oxygen starvation, again, the, the pattern of activity will be unique. If you're in sensory deprivation, right? If you go into one of these sensory deprivation chambers, I think you float in liquid and, I don't know, hypnosis, meditation, but there's a variety of these different states of consciousness. One of them, which I'm incredibly skeptical of, is this notion of lucid dreaming. So lucid dreaming is distinctly different from normal dreaming in that while you're dreaming, you realize that you are dreaming, okay? <laughs> that you recognize that you are in the act of dreaming. And so I get a little bit, uh, a little bit wary of anything that sounds new agey like this. Okay? So the, the, the idea is that if you are having a lucid dream, you can explore your own mind in ways that you could never possibly explore while you were awake. I'm like, I don't know. And some people that work on this kind of, this sounds really touchy-feely to me, right? Like, you got some crystals to go with that. But uh, they argue that you can um, learn how to create a lucid dream, right? Uh, not for me. Here's the meditation, as I already described a little bit. Um, enhancing self-knowledge, well-being, something like that. You know what? I actually had to take two two uh, PE courses in college, you know, to get my diploma. I took bowling and I took techniques of relaxation. I got course credit. <laughs> you have to wait until your senior year to get those though because they fill. <laughs> right? They fill really fast. Oh, some other idiots took walking or running in the morning. I'm like, no, meditation in the afternoon. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, hallucinations, as we said, sensory perceptions that are unrelated to outside events. Um, and there, there's a lot of things that can cause hallucinations. My, um, I, I remember when my great-grandmother my great -grandmother was dying, um, in, in, in the very last few days of her death, she just absolutely, everything was a hallucination. She was just, she couldn't remember who was who, what was what, and she was seeing all kinds of crazy things and saying some things that were really, really odd. But different drugs can do this, different, uh, even as we said, uh, food deprivation can lead to hallucinations, right? All kinds of things. Fever, high fever, yeah, high fever can absolutely cause hallucinations. Um, yada, yada, yada. Religious ecstasy, which is similar to those Catholic nuns, but not quite. Uh, you know, in, in uh, certain sects of Christianity, they, they uh, believe in speaking in tongues. Okay? I grew up in a Catholic church, and we don't do no speaking in tongues in a Catholic church. So when I went to a couple of Protestant churches and saw this, it was a little odd to me. Very, very odd. In fact, some, some uh, Christian, uh, like the Pentecostals, for example, that the notion of speaking in tongues is a a uh, very important part of your relationship with God. And I, I, I was really weirded out by this whole thing. But uh, people that speak in tongues, they, they clearly have, have a brain state that is just nowhere near what it is anywhere else. Huh? But the one that I want to spend a couple more minutes on, because it's more interesting, is hypnosis. Okay? So is hypnosis, is it a real thing or is it a state of crap? What is it? Real or fake? I'd say fake. Fake? I think fake. Fake? You know, some people can be hypnotized and have major surgery with no anesthesia. You still think it's fake? Uh, some people, some, not all. Maybe. Some people are easier to hypnotize than others, okay? 
In fact, uh, in one study, what they did was they, they took a bunch of people, they tried to hypnotize them, and uh, some people don't get hypnotized, okay? So in that way, it makes you think that you're in charge. You are in charge about whether or not hypnosis works, okay? Then they found some people that they called highly hypnotizable. It was easy to put them into a hypnotic state, etc. So then they took these people that were highly hypnotizable, and then what they did was they, they were given some presentations about hypnotism to these people, and one of the things they said was, oh yeah, people that are easily hypnotizable tend to be incredibly gullible people. Kind of dull. All right? Next time you try to hypnotize those people, guess what? They wouldn't be hypnotized. <laughs> so <laughs> once we take those people and tell them that kind of, a, it wasn't. I mean, I'm not saying that's true. It's just that's what they've said in the study, right? And it was amazing that all of a sudden you couldn't hypnotize them. Okay, um, I've only really seen one hypnosis demonstration. It was here at Wesleyan one time, um, over in over in the, the old athletic center there, and. Uh, the guy ended up, he brought like 20 people up on stage to hypnotize him, and you know, within the first two minutes, he was down to five, right? He just, he was like, you're on it, you're not doing this. He had five, and it, it was impressive what he was doing with these dudes, especially one kid, I don't know, oh, that poor kid. They, he, he got it, so he's like, okay, now, you know, when he was hypnotized. Okay, now, when you leave this, it was the, the gym, when you leave the gymnasium, when you walk through the door, you're going to cock a doodle doo as loud as you can like a chicken. All right? And you won't know why. <laughs> so it, everybody in this audience, now everybody's awake, the event is over, and everybody's watching this kid. And this kid, he doesn't know what the hell's going on. He walks out that door, and lo and behold, he does it. Okay? <laughs> I'm glad I was not dumb enough to volunteer to go up there, okay? I've learned things. So hypnosis is a cooperative social action, okay, where they become more suggestible, okay? Um, a state of heightened openness to a suggestion. So some people think that under hypnosis, you can do magical things here, right? Look at this, the human plank. This is a hypnotized person, but guess what? You and I, we could probably do this too, but we wouldn't do this. You see the difference? I mean, you'll do things that you wouldn't normally do, but you're not gonna do things that you could not normally do, okay? So it doesn't, it doesn't turn any magic. Uh, can it alleviate pain? Oh yeah, like I'm saying, major, major surgery. But in one study, this was fascinating, what they did, uh, is, is you take a bucket of ice water and put your arm in a bucket of ice water, it is going to be painful very quickly. Incredibly painful. Okay? So they put them, put the arm in the ice bucket and you, they ask you to hold it in there as long as you can handle the pain. And it's like maybe 30 seconds, maybe. Okay? Now they take somebody, they hypnotize you, say you feel no pain. Put your ice, you know, arm in there as long as you can. The guy's got it in there three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Do you feel anything? No pain. I feel no pain. No pain. Holy crap. All right. Here's the deal. Here's a button. You've got your arm in the bucket of ice. Here's a button. If there's any part of you that's feeling pain, push the button. And so the, the person that's hypnotized says, I feel no pain, but this button, bing, 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 down, holy shit, I feel pain. <laughs> All right? So it's there, but maybe you partitioned it or something? Kind of pushed it to one side. I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a hypnosis person, but it's pretty interesting. Some people believe that hypnosis can be used, especially in like therapy, to help people remember childhood experiences that they otherwise could not remember. Okay? So they use this thing, honestly, it's called age regression therapy. All right? Where they're going to hypnotize you and bring you back. So here's here's this uh, study. For me. Okay, you're, you're hypnotized now. I'm, I'm, you're now, you know, you're now 12. You're now nine. You know, now it's your fourth birthday. So we brought you back in time. It's your fourth birthday, and then they asked what day of the week it was. Okay, and the people were 82 percent correct. And I was like, dang, that's impressive, right? Because 
you would if if not if this was random, it would be one in seven, right? Because there's seven days a week, and so eighty-two percent. But nobody else could 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 replicate the study. They went back and they they figured out that he did not in fact say what day of the week is it. He said, is it Monday? Is it Tuesday? The key is he already knew the correct answer. Okay, he knew it was a Wednesday. So he was, is it Monday? Is it Tuesday? Is it Wednesday? Yeah, he changed the inflection of his voice in some way, whether on purpose or not. And so the person that was hypnotized was able to pick up on the change in the tone of the voice on the correct answer. Okay, so it, it I don't I, Is it bullshit? Uh, if you believe it's bullshit, it's bullshit. If you believe it's true, you can have major surgery. You know. Um, no. So post-hypnotic suggestions, as we said, can be cock and doodle do, but it has been to some limited success. Has, hypnosis has been used as a stop smoking treatment or a weight loss treatment, perhaps anxiety. Um, I am incredibly skeptical um, about it, but... Um, you know, there, there's some evidence out there, but it it, it it raises my giant science red flag, right? I just it just doesn't feel right to me. Uh, it cannot do miracles. It cannot, uh, you know, do things that you would not be able to do in an unhypnotized state. Okay, so that's what we got for uh, unit one, right? So remember, everything is open till Monday. Then come exam time, 10.30 in the morning. Hopefully you've already made a study guide before exam. All right, I need to catch the rest of my attendance because there was quite a few people that popped in in those minutes there.